So water and steam have been um, seen as a source of, source of health for millennia, with ground, spring and thermal waters especially prized. This can be seen in architecture constructed for bathing, ritual, healing and leisure. Waters perceived to have healing properties in ancient Greece were associated with Asclepius, the god of medicine. And Greek architecture and landscapes reflected this religious importance with temples often located close to natural springs. But it was the Romans who were most famous to, for developing a network of bathing places known as thermae, not only for healing, but also for recreational bathing. The baths of Caracalla, constructed 212 uh, CE, were an extensive complex with recreational facilities, including swimming pool, gymnasium, exercise courts, libraries, shops, and gardens. While varying in scale, Roman baths followed a standard plan, reflecting the process of bathing. Typically, the bather entered a changing area to undress and then moved to a warm room, tepidarium, to work up a sweat. From there, they moved through increasingly hotter spaces to the hottest room, coldarium, and then into a dry heat sweating room, laconium. The bather would then wash in a cooler room uh, and possibly take a dip in water um, in a pool before entering the largest cooler, cooling changer, frigidarium. The development of such complexes also depended on technology, including aqueducts and a hypercourse system in which heated air was directed under the floors, enabling the temperature to be regulated. With the expansion of their empire, Roman bathing, Roman bathing places developed around naturally occurring springs across Europe, including at Aix-en-Provence in France, Bay near Naples in Italy, and Aqua Aurelia at Baden-Baden in Germany. As the Romans retreated, many of these fell into disuse. Of those which remained in use was Aquasulus, later be to become known as Bath in England. Following its reconstruction in the 11th century, Bath attracted pilgrims from across Europe. The recognition of the health benefits of springs led to the development of these water sources. However, they provoked opposition as well, with charges of immorality from religious cultures who were concerned about nudity. The diseases which were believed to accompany such immorality were also much discussed in relation to public bathing. The architectural development around springs became more widespread in the late 17th and early 18th centuries, with interest in the therapeutic benefits of bathing and hydrotherapy from medical professions. Spa town's popularity was lent legitimacy by an increase in books on the hydropathy. Spa towns were beginning to transform from the fashionable watering places associated with licentious behaviour into more serious healing places. Advocates of cold water bathing included uh, John Floyer, whose books were influential. And when the Reverend, Reverend John Wesley published his popular Primitive Physic in 1747, which recommended cold water bathing for ailments, then the moral concerns around the religious propriety of bathing seemed to be overcome. Not only was bathing associated with cure from disease, but its role in bodily cleanliness was gaining importance. As noted by Brian Ladd, this became evident in John Wesley's quoting of the aphorism, cleanliness is next to godliness. In 1660, Dr. Robert Whitty wrote Scarborough Spa, in which he advocated sea bathing for medical conditions such as gout. And Richard Russell in the following century added to this with his dissertation on the use of seawater. Sea bathing took place not only for gout, rickets and melancholia, but also for recreational purposes, spurring on the development of several English seaside resorts including Eastbourne, Brighton and Scarborough. At Margate, medical doctor and philanthropist Dr John Letson established the Royal Sea Bathing Infirmary in 1796 to provide a fresh air, sea and sun treatment regimen. Designed by the Reverend John Pruden, the infirmary wards opened onto verandas and piazzas 
and were set on the pier with access to the water using bathing machines, which you can see being horse-drawn um, in the bottom print. Bathing machines also were, are evident in this um, print at Gravesend. And you can see the bathers were wheeled down to the ocean's edge where they got out under cover and could bathe or if they were um, able to, could swim in the salt water. But it was in the 1830s in Gruffenburg now Lasne Jesenik in the Czech Republic, that Vincent Prisnitz implemented a hydropathic re regimen which captured the public imagination. His treatment became known as the cold water cure and included exercise, whole foods and cold water showers in natural pine forest surroundings. The cold water cure spread around the world from Russia to the United States of America with Captain Claridge publishing about it in Britain. However, within the medical profession, there were skeptics as well as advocates, with the medical journal The Lancet sustaining a war against hydrotherapy in the words of medical historian Robin Price between 1842 and 1852. In Germany, which had the greatest number of spas and hydropathic establishments in Europe, cold water wraps, baths, showers and the drinking of waters became a valued part of treatment sought by health tourists in the 19th century. Hydropathic establishments like this one in Scotland were, were to be found throughout the world from Europe to the USA to Australia. While in, while in England, Bath was noted in Bradshaw's Railway Guide as being, quote, renowned in the world of fashionable invalids. Bath's attractions included not only its well-known private barns, but also public public funds, indicating that such facilities were no longer seen as solely the preserve of the aristocracy, but were being used by growing middle class as well. Treatments there included bathing or showering in various temperature waters, being covered in wet wraps, as well as the drinking of the sometimes unpleasant tasting and smelling um, water, which often had purgative after effects. The pump room, named after the factors that that's where the pump or the water source was located, was not only used for drinking the water, but increasingly as a venue for socialising. Quite often in spa towns, the pump room was more of a pavilion, and many of these were <coughs> relatively small domed buildings constructed over the water source. In Europe, the trinkhallen or drinking halls were much like the pump rooms, designed as places to drink the waters of the spring. The association of holidaying with a more serious purpose meant that even as water cures lessened in their medical standing, the practice of visiting spas to rest and recuperate continued into the 19th century. Spa architecture in both Europe and Britain was often grand in scale and detail, refle reflecting not only the elevated status of spas and the importance assigned to the healing properties of the waters, but also to the type of clients those operating them were attempting to attract. The spa at Carlo Vivari attracted visitors with its naturally carbonated thermal springs. And this increased in popularity in the 16th century as medical treatments were made available, such as bathing in mineral water, um, which was transported to bathhouses along wooden troughs. But it was later in the 19th century that the therapeutic bathing really developed and with it, the architecture of the spa town. The medical treatment regimen at European spas, including the drinking of waters, as well as various bathing pra practices, including showers, massage, relaxing, steaming and wrapping, along with regimented diets and exercise. Along with these, the guests would often partake in social and sporting activities, such as gambling, dancing, riding, hunting, promenading and theatre, in order to provide attractive facilities for all of these activities. <coughs> The spa town architecture developed. Tourist facilities included hotels and inns, gardens, walking trails, lookouts and promenades, as well as those catering for social pursuits with assembly rooms, casinos, theatres and restaurants. 
a Kerr house or conversation house was a building type especially common in spa towns and designed for conversation and gathering. At Calaviri, spa architecture included the Mill Colonnade of 1871 to 81, which covered five of the town's springs with a columned gallery and which became the focus of the spa town. Colonnades were a perfect place for promenading and gathering in the fresh air, as well as providing shelter during inclement weather. They often reflected the architectural precedents set by the Romans with their classical architectural style. This, at Spa, the public baths were grand as well, following the classical architectural style, this time with a Renaissance twist. The Puhon at Spa, which was built over the spring source, was built over a spring source. And interestingly, in the bottom image, you can see um, to the left, there's a pharmacy quite nearby. Spa towns and resorts also developed in the Americas and at colonial outposts around the world. At Saratoga Springs in New York, the development around the early 19th century was very much focused on the leisure aspect of the town rather than the medical one. And while I don't have time to explore this in detail today, many of these resort towns followed the European model with not only bathing and drinking places, but associated leisure and holidaying facilities as well. At the same time as hydropathic establishments and spa towns were attracting visitors, the hammam or hot air vapor bath was brought to Britain by returning tourists. Hammams developed in the Muslim world from Byzantine bathhouses and the remains of hammams <coughs> have been uncovered dating back to the 9th and 10th centuries. Hammams fulfilled several purposes, not simply to achieve bodily hygiene, but also for religious cleansing. They also they served as a public gathering place and a focal point of the neighbourhood. Over the Ottoman period, the physical layout of the hammam developed into a radial type plan with the hot room and its platform for massage as the main central space located under a dome, which in some uh, hammams was set by glass rondels. The spatial layout of hammams differed from Roman style public baths, reflecting a different method of cleansing, that of perspiration induced by heat and steam. During the 19th century, travel by European tourists brought about an exchange in ideas between the Ottoman Empire and the rest of Europe. Architectural historian Siegfried Gideon has recognized this characteristic, claiming that the 19th century was that century which looked so much towards other cultures. While not the first to praise the hammam, Scottish-born diplomat David Urquhart, who was posted in Constantinople, became a vocal advocate for the adoption of such baths in Britain. In his 1850 book, The Pillars of Hercules, Urquhart drew attention to the lack of bathing facilities in his home country, praising her mums for their health benefit. David Urquhart became involved in the development and management of Turkish baths in Britain, including London's public Turkish bath, the German Street Hammam, designed by architect George Summers Clark and constructed in 1861. Architect Robert Owen Alsop in his 1890 book on the Turkish bath described the hammam system as a heat bath for hygiene, remedial and curative pro, uh, purposes. From a hydropathic medical model, the Victorian Turkish bath in Britain evolved into something akin to the Roman baths where socialization and relaxation became as an important a part of the experience as seeking a cure. With many Turkish baths in Britain aimed at local tourists or pleasure seekers, their architectural expression was an eclectic mix of styles thought to be reflective of the Orient. Elements included minaret styled towers or chimneys, decorative fretwork, pointed <coughs> art, and doors, and the use of colored glass mirrors and tiling. In the increasingly commercialised leisure world, Alsop recognised that, and I quote, with the public, the best bath will be the most elaborate and the most flashily decorated, and the moth and candle principle comes into play, end quote. One which opened in 1882 was the Dalston Junction Turkish Baths in London, designed by John Hatchard Smith. But not all Turkish baths in Britain attempted to mimic these styles of architecture. 
Some were neoclassical, evoking Greek and Roman styles. Others were Queen Anne, and many were vernacular, reflecting the local context in which they were built. They also spread across the British colonies, as well as the United States um, of America and Europe. The hot air bun was claimed, had been claimed by Urquhart to have eased pain associated with his neuralgia. And it was argued that it, was cure, it could cure cancer, tuberculosis, leprosy and infertility. Yet as with the cold water cures, the medical press ridiculed the Turkish bath mania, calling into question the health effects. Much as the spa had suffered from reputational damage stemming from fears over public nudity in previous times, the Victorian Turkish baths also became disreputable once the faith in the medical um, effect waned. With sanitary reform in the Victorian period, baths began to be viewed less as health and leisure resorts for the wealthy and middle classes, and more as places associated with cleanliness for the poorer classes. The cities and towns of industrial Britain were the cradle of this type of public bath development due to the rapidly increasing urban population, middle-class fears of disease, and the want of a healthier workforce. Without the infrastructure for piped water or sewerage at both an urban level and a household level, people had to re rely upon water from local wells, standpipes and pumps in the street for their drinking, cooking and bathing and washing water. English sanitary reformer Edwin Chadwick's report on the sanitary condition of the labouring population of Great Britain from 1842 received much attention and from those, interest, from those interested in health and sanitation. In it, Chadwick recognised that one of the barriers to cleanliness was the lack of water supply. And following Chadwick's ideas, he believed that when filth was washed away, the worker became both clean and healthy. Early in the 19th century, baths funded by the Corporation of Liverpool had been erected at St George's Pierhead to a design by city surveyor architect John Foster Jr. to replace um, earlier sea bathing facilities there. These baths incorporated water pumped from the river for swimming baths for men and for women, as well as offering private, cold, shower, warm, tepid, medicated and vapour baths. Architectural historian Thomas Marcus identified the public bathhouse as one of the new architectural types which emerged in the 19th century. An example of this type was the Frederick Street Baths and Wash Houses in Liverpool, opened in May 1842. They were fresh water warm, fresh water warm baths with individual bathing cubicles provided by the uh, Municipal Council. Another architect designed public bathhouse was St Pancras in London. Built in 1845 to designs by Thomas Aldwinkle, the baths were justified in the press where it was argued that, and I quote, indeed, it is hard to understand upon what ground the use of a bath, which is so much lauded amongst the rich, can longer be denied to the poor, end quote. The simple and economic features resulted in a utilitarian interior one which placed function at the centre of the design. The Spartan interiors suggest a selection of hard, impervious surfaces with little decoration, aiding in keeping the public baths and wash houses clean. The baths and wash houses at St Giles in the Fields and St George Bloomsbury by Bailey and, and Pownall Architects, <coughs> which opened in 1854, provided both first and class, first and second class, men's and women's individual bathing cubicles, with slipper baths, but also a swimming pool for men and an extensive wash house or laundry facilities for women. And you can notice here all the different entrances for the different classes and the different genders. Other architects who were active in designing these facilities were Arthur Aspital and John Whitcourt, who published their book, Observations on Baths and Wash Houses in 1851. And it was partly through such publications that the idea of public baths began to travel throughout the world. Architectural magazines cast judgment on them, with the Builder magazine stating in 1864 that public baths, and I quote, 
ought not to be laid out on a grand and expensive scale. Such places ought to be plain, simple, and above all economical. While the Penny Cyclopedia of the Society for Diffusion of Useful Knowledge recorded that, quote, in general character then, these establishments are pretty much alike. The exterior is usually a plain brick building with stone coins and dressings, having a basement and in front a story above it, with a lofty square ventilating and chimney shaft somewhat like a campanile in appearance. The function of the building can be seen expressed both through its exterior and its numerous entry points for the different classes and genders. A chimney for smoke from the boilers and quite often signage indicating the public nature of the building. The procedure for visitors to public baths was similar across the buildings as well. The bather entered the appropriate entrance, either first or second class, men's or women's, and purchased their ticket. With this in hand, they would proceed to the waiting room, where they would be able to browse reading materials, including newspapers, magazines, pamphlets, and health manuals, until a bathing space came available. The bath attendant would fetch them and show them to their bath cubicle, where they would find a bathtub, and depending on class, extras, such as a mirror, brushes, carpet, chair, towels and soap, and possibly a tap for regulating the water temperature. The bather would be given a set time, usually 20 or 30 minutes, to undress, bathe, dry and redress, after which time the attendant would return, empty and clean the bath and remove the wet towels ready for the next bather. In keeping with their purpose, building interiors were designed to be easily cleaned. Uh, through the use of materials such as enameled shape, slate and glazed bricks and tiles, which were not just used in the bathing spaces, but also in the waiting rooms and corridors. The bathtub itself underwent a technological development during this time. The early slipper baths of the 1850s were made of copper and zinc, or occasionally cement and tile. From the 1880s, cast iron, porcelain enameled baths, often with wooden rims, became standard. Baths and wash houses also required mechanical plants to heat the water and boilers, engines and pumps were essential parts of a bathhouse complex, as were the engineers and mechanics employed to maintain the equipment. The wash house or laundry was a function allied with public bath complexes. Undertaken by women, laundry could be washed and dried within the complex, following a highly structured process enabled by the layout of the facilities. A survey of public bathhouses conducted in 1918 and compiled by Agnes Campbell reported that most towns over 50,000 people in Britain had some form of bathing facility. European spa culture, which had principally existed for therapeutic and recreational purposes, was accessible only to the wealthy and middle classes and did not have hygiene and cleanliness as its rationale. But in the 19th century, um, in Germany, the ideal of personal cleanliness and its association with health and morals increased in popularity. By 1855, Germany had established char charitable facilities for bathing, both in Hamburg and Berlin. And by the 1880s, a German solution to the need to bathe for cleanliness was provided by English-born Berlin-based sanitary engineer David Grove who designed shower baths for installation in barracks, schools, prisons, factories, as well as public bath buildings. But Germany's interest in matters relating to health and hygiene became even more evident with the staging of the Exhibition for Hygiene and Emergency Rescue of 1883 in Berlin. A Volkswagen bad or people's shower was installed in the gardens outside the exhibition buildings by dermatologist, Dr. Oscar Lazar. This was a corrugated iron cabin shell, which contained 10 individual shower cubicles with hot water, soap, and a towel provided for 10 pfennigs. Reportedly, it attracted 10,000 visitors for a shower during the exhibition. By the early 20th century, um, German state-sponsored people's baths were described as offering baths for hygiene and cleanliness as well as medicinal, therapeutic and recreational facilities. The architectural forms of European and particularly German baths included both the lower cost local people's baths 
as well as more extensive, expensively built municipal bathhouses, which provided not only showers, but also recreational facilities, such as swimming pools and Turkish baths, as you can see here. The Muller's Volksbad, which opened in 1901, was quite an elaborate example, designed by architect Karl Hochschetter. Please excuse my Australian pronunciation throughout. Across the Atlantic in the United States of America during the 18th century, natural springs had been used for bathing for their health benefits. But following the European precedent, spas became tourist attractions for the wealthy before hydrotherapy and the cold water cure became popular in the mid 19th century. Commercially run private bathhouses intended for the middle classes also offered bathing facilities in urban areas during this period. And before bathrooms in private homes became common, this was quite essential. However, this left the poorer classes without any facilities for washing. And as journalist Jacob Riss remarked, quote, the great unwashed were not so from choice. Following the establishment of the Association for Improving the Condition of the Poor, the AICP, in New York in 1843, the focus on slum improvement through public health reforms and environmental amelioration gained attention and similar organisations were founded in cities throughout America. The AICP built the People's Bathing and Washing Establishment, seen here, at um, 141 Mott Street, New York, in 1853. In 1889, German-born physician, Dr. Simon Baruch, began to publicize his views on the benefits of public bathing and soon became an authoritative voice for the movement in America. His idea was to provide economical, efficient bathing for large numbers of people through a network of local bathhouses following the German precedent with showers, which he termed douche baths. The AICP was convinced by Baruch's arrangement and in August 1891, the People's Baths opened in the Bowery, New York. Designed by J.C. Caddy and Co. architects, the three-storied brick and terracotta building with arched openings was able to cater for 500 bathers a day with 25 shower cubicles. In a report by the Mayor's Committee of New York City in 1897, showers were praised because, quote, the most perfect cleanliness is ensured and all the risks of infection or of the communication of contagious disease or was inseparable from the use of the ordinary bathtub are avoided. The American people's baths had been intended to be practical, efficient, utilitarian and designed for ease of maintenance and hygiene. But with their becoming an increasingly visible institution provided by municipal government, architectural historian Andrea Renner has noted that bathhouse design was equally concerned with civic pride. In 1902, New York-based architects York and Sawyer designed two model bathhouses for the AICP. And the first to be constructed was the West 41st Street Baths in 1904. The two-story building with its Beaux-Arts facade reflected the architectural style common for public buildings of the period. Natural light through glass Skylights illuminated the bathhouse from above, while large arched windows on the street facade allowed light into the waiting rooms. Other architects followed the general plan and style, constructing several more over the next decade. So now to swimming pools, which as part of the facilities provided in early public bathhouses, bathhouses were often no lot more than plunge pools, but they grew in importance as bath, um, as bath, as in bathhouses, as swimming and water sports began to be recognized as recreational pursuits in the latter part of the 19th century. Historically in Europe, floating swimming baths had been established in the late 17th century. Generally privately run, the best known was the Piscine de Ligny in Paris, more to the Quai d'Orsay since um, Napoleon's time. German dramatist Auguste von Kotzbue recorded his impressions of the baths in Paris in 1804, mentioning, and I quote, the floating baths on the Seine, of which those at Vigie are particularly wanting of notice, 
In point of order and elegance, they are, however, in my opinion, far inferior to the floating bath of Berlin, but superior in magnitude. But the superior magnitude of the Parisian is more strike, striking by being surrounded by odiferous flowers and shady trees. However, by 1869, landscape designer William Robinson was calling them, and I quote, the ugliest things to be seen from its banks on summer, which in some places half cover its surface. Despite his disliking of the Parisian floating barns, Robinson believed they were preferable to the situation in London's Hyde Park, where one had to, and I quote from Robinson, tolerate the astounding exhibition of naked humanity, which may be witnessed on the Serpentine on any warm summer evening. As urban historian Helen Miller has noted, across Britain, swimming was a common means of getting clean, with citizens, though mainly boys, using water bodies such as the Trent River in Nottingham and the Floating Harbour in Bristol as places to achieve this. The quality of the water in which the public was swimming, however, was not necessarily the cleanest nor the healthiest, with Bristol's harbour not only the source of water for the floating baths, but it also took the sewerage outfalls um, from the town. In New York in 1889, 15 baths were moored on the East River for the use of the residents of the nearby tenements. The attraction and recreational opportunities offered by swimming baths were soon recognized by authorities on both sides of the Atlantic. While still couched in health terms, the shift from hygienic cleansing to an exercise changed the architecture of bathhouses to swimming baths, with the pool taking centre stage over the individual bathing cu uh, cubicles. A slim volume on the swimming bath of London was written by open air swimming bath advocate Dr. R.E. Dudgeon in 1870. In it, he lamented the fact that the city had no open air pools, but several indoor facilities, of which he was very wary of swimming in due to their hygienic condition. In many of the British swimming baths, the pool was used predominantly during summer months, but in winter could be closed and covered over to create a hall and a venue for public events. While, public, while private swimming pools had existed from earlier in the century, the first municipal swimming pool in the United States was at Brookline Public Bath in Massachusetts. Designed by architect F. Joseph Untersee in 1897 as a recreational pool catering for the middle class, it was promoted as having what were described at the time as swimming facilities as well as cleanliness baths. This shift in priority was a response to both the need for recreational facilities, but also to the increasing availability of baths, showers and laundries with running water and sewerage in private homes. Across the United States of America, African-American residents, however, were excluded from these new recreational facilities, not being allowed to swim in the same pool as white residents, a situation which was mirrored in other countries, with Indigenous members of the Australian community unwelcome at swimming pools in Australia well into the 1960s. In the city of Melbourne, Australia, the Melbourne City Baths opened in 1904 to replace earlier municipal facilities which had operated on the same site since 1860. Designed by architects John James Clark and Edward J. Clark, the red brick and white cement rendered baths were a result of a competition held by the Municipal Council. Designed principally as swimming baths, the Melbourne City Bath provided all types of facilities associated with public bathing, with two heated swimming pools, with galleries, dressing boxes, slipper baths, spray baths, Turkish baths, vapour baths, a Jewish ceremonial mikvah bath and laundry. Segregated men's and women's facilities and first and, class, um, first and second class divisions were also made concrete, concrete in the architecture. The public swimming pool had emerged as a recreational setting in its own right by the early 20th century and many older bath houses were rebuilt to incorporate pools. But with the health benefits of fresh air and sunlight growing in popularity, indoor pools found competition with outdoor open air swimming pools. The increased focus on the healthy fit and tanned body also created a demand for places to exercise and display, 
with spectators and sunbathers provided with full surrounds on which to sit or lie and watch the swimmers. Despite the cold northern European temperatures, meaning that outdoor cold water pools could only be used in the summer months, many were built in cooler climate countries, including the Netherlands, Switzerland and Germany. The increasing number of swimming pools being constructed coincided with the modern era of competitive sports, with the first modern Olympics in 1896 in Athens, including swimming, including swimming in the um, events. Competitive swimming and diving gained popularity and pools were designed to facilitate these as sports with lanes and diving um, platforms. In the 20th century, swimming pools began to be co-located with other recreational, health, fitness and sports facilities. The Pioneer Health Centre in Peckham, in London, has been celebrated as an experiment in preventative health, but it can be seen as having its roots stretching far, as far back as the Roman baths complexes. Constructed in 1935, it was the creation of two medical doctors, George Scott Williamson and Ines Pierce, was designed by engineer Owen Williams. The building design incorporated recreational facilities such as gymnasium, cafeteria and theatre, but at, it, at its centre was the glassed roof hall for the swimming pool. Alongside these were medical consultation rooms and research laboratories for the observation of healthy families who were the intended users of the centre. While its life as a social experiment was short-lived, it closed during the war and was taken over by the London uh, County Council in 1950, the modernist building with its concrete structural frame and glass facade allowed natural light to flood the interior, arguably influencing the design of future multi-purpose recreational swimming facilities. So to draw all of these threads together, thermal baths, hydropathic resorts and spas, vapor baths and sea baths had all developed around understandings of health of the time. Public bathing changed focus, however, with the industrial and sanitary revolution, as baths began to be viewed less as health resorts and more as places associated with the cleanliness of the body and clothing, especially for those seen as the lower classes. Funded privately and then by philanthropic organisations and local governments, public baths were not unflawed. They reinforced divisions in society along the lines of race, class and gender, and often between cultural groups as well. The design of baths was driven by functionality, particularly the user's progression through spaces. However, this did not preclude a desire for civic pride to be expressed through what was seen as appropriate architectural styles. The architecture of baths was integrated with heating, plumbing, ventilating technologies of the day. And together with sanitary engineers and architects, physicians contributed to the design of baths, spreading the movement through the publication of their designs in books and journals, which took the ideas around the world. As water supplies and sewerage were introduced more widely into homes, the requirement for baths and wash houses diminished and a revised role as a place of recreation and swimming took over, changing both their function and their architecture. This led either to their demolition or to their rebuilding or repurposing with swimming pools becoming the main attraction and reflecting the modern period in which a healthy body and mind was increasingly linked to exercise and fitness and when cleanliness was taken as a given. Today's talk has given just a brief foray into the architecture of bathing, which I hope has provided you with some glimpses of the history behind these buildings. And hopefully we'll have some wonderful questions and conversation um, starting now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julie, um, for this uh, real sort of foray into 2000 years of uh, bathing from uh, the ancient uh, Mediterranean uh, cultures uh, via Northern Europe to Northern America and Australia. Um, yes, um, before we open the floor um, to the public. Um, we have um, Oliver Zucco uh, giving us a few comments on the talk, uh, perhaps also 
hopefully stimulating uh, our questions, our discussion a bit. Um, we decided due to the high number of participants um, that we would like to ask you to use the chat uh, to make us aware of uh, questions or comments that you want to get rid of. So please enter uh, your question, your comments or your willingness to speak out in uh, the chat and my colleague Henrike will have a close eye on it and then we will try to sort of facilitate as many questions and comments as we can. But uh, first, uh, I would like to uh, offer the floor to Oliver for his comments. Thank you, Christian. And thank you so much, Julie, for this uh, really inspiring and I think thought-provoking talk on the complex relationships of architecture, health and design. And I would also like to thank uh, Christian and the Hera team for having me today. And it's really a pleasure being here. I think that it was uh, for everybody here interested or being interested in the different histories of health, very exciting. So thanks again, Julie, for sharing some of your research results with us here today. And I really can only recommend your book very strongly. It's a pleasure to read. Uh, by the way, if anybody wonders, the background you see here is uh, a project of 1875 uh, for a hotel complex uh, by the Viennese architect Emil Förster for the Czech spa town Marianske Lasne. So this brings me to my background and to my interest because I am researching currently on a central European spa architecture of the 19th century. And uh, since a lot of our guests here today might be interested in related topics too, I am looking forward to our discussion and I'm pretty sure that there are a lot of questions out there from the audience. But before I hand over, um, let me please allow, or let me allow, uh, um, allow me please to quote from a source to start our conversation, Julie. In 1874, um, Elim Henri Davigdor, a French born son of an Italian aristocrat and an English noblewoman who worked as a civil engineer for railroad companies in Burma, China, Hungary, and Austria published um, a book entitled The Well-Being of People in Big Cities with a Special Consideration for Vienna. In the introduction, David Dor gives a legitimation for his publication. And uh, I would like to quote from this book directly because I think it's really related to your conversation. So the quote, sanitary technology as such, and as a science that is separate from actual sanitary maintenance, is not properly, properly recognized in either Austria or Germany. The medical services are and will be left to the doctors alone. The engineer who deals with sewage, drainage and irrigation alone, whose sphere of activity begins where the doctor's work ends, has so far only existed as a recognized authority in England and France. Yet it seems strange that improving communication should be considered more important than prolonging human life that shipping canals are considered more than rubbish canals, and that the improvement of poor health conditions in large cities is left entirely to the doctors. And he continues, in England and France, all medical committees consist of doctors and technicians. The doctors find the defi def deficiencies, the engineer eliminates them. In order to draw attention to this very important, above all else to be considered subject, I wrote the chapters on dwelling, on fresh air, on sprinkling and sewerage, irrigation and sanitary technology in general are no longer in the experimental stage in England and France, but are already an independent science. And I have endeavored as far as my weak strengths allow it to obtain the same recognition here in Austria. So um, it seems that David Dorr had a very clear opinion on the situation of the 1870s in Vienna and in comparison to England and France. And uh, so my first question, Julie, would be, what do you think, what role might the political or economic system of Great Britain or France in the 19th century have played for the establishment of architectures of health and ideas of public hygiene? Do we have any uh, comments on that? Um well, I find that quite interesting because when you actually look at the medical science and, and where the kind of um, the breakthroughs were being made, I mean, I mean, around centered around Germany, and you look at the medical science that was coming out of Germany and Europe, um, which, from a kind of uh, 
uh, medical or bacteriological kind of side of things, um, they was they were doing, you know, the stuff. They were kind of finding out all about the diseases. Um, so from that medical science, it's interesting that she doesn't see the two sides talking to each other. So the medical versus the engineering and architectural. And I guess that is where the kind of the UK and the sanitary science, they did seem to be talking to each other a lot more. Um, and this is something which I've found dropped off again as we come into the 20th century, all of a sudden the professions divided themselves again. So there was that wonderful time during that sanitary revolution that came just after the industrial revolution where in the UK, um, the professions came together, but then in the 20th century, they kind of diverged again. I find it really interesting that a woman um, was writing that as well. That's quite um, rare. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you showed some uh, images and pictures of Kalavivari as one of the most, or yeah, most um, recognized summer capitals of Europe. And I totally agree that this town is really interesting also uh, in the development of very specific uh, spa architecture. And this brings me uh, from my own research to uh, the second question. Um, how would you describe the relationship of urban centers and spa towns? I mean, both were kind of uh, centers of innovation, I think. Um, but how would you describe their entanglements in the 19th century from your um, case studies? Well, I, I think one of the interesting things which kind of actually comes up is um, which kind of goes a little bit back to your previous question was the idea of transport and transportation and trains and um, the way that holiday makers um, or medical tourists um, got around. So how did they get from towns to the country? So that link between the country and the town is a really interesting kind of aspect of that. Um, and also, I guess if we're talking about the wealthier people who may have had both country residences and town residences and then retreated to their summer retreats or retreated to a, a spa town um, for their holidays and those kind of things. I think that's um, the, the city country is an interesting kind of aspect and that's where when you start to look as we go into that 19th century period and the development of town planning where the Rus in Herb or the kind of the idea of the, su the suburbs started to come up as well. So it's kind of like the, the spa towns in a way were the ideal town, the ideal place to live that everyone would love to live all year round. But of course, not everyone could because they had their business in the towns. Um, but I think in terms of the way that they possibly influenced the idea of suburb design, um, when you start to look at the early town planning ideas that were coming out um, um, of the UK around that turn of the century, the idea of the garden city would be very interesting to look and see what we can find in terms of garden city ideas that may have come from the idea of the resort town or the spa town, because I think that ideal country house um, has a lot of resonances with the spa town um, and the, I, the way that the suburb with its green belt around um, developed um, maybe harks back to the spa town. One of the interesting things about spa towns I find is the way that the medical regimen which might have involved fresh air and country walks and exercise that were mandated as a way to be healthy um, changed the landscape and, and walk, walks with pavilions and lookouts um, and how that may have influenced the idea of the green belt, um, mm -hmm. which later um, came part of the way that the city and the suburbs were, um, were separated and the way the suburbs as a middle class um, place to be kind of developed um, in that kind of going into the 19th century. So I think there's quite a, a bit of research to be done in that, that kind of aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I mean, um, uh, if you look um, at, at Vienna at the late 19th, uh, 19th century, I mean, there's a very <clears throat> intense debate and discussion uh, with art historians, um, practitioners in city planning and architects about how to develop Vienna. Should it be more metropolis-like with the Ringstraße or is it more the cottage quarter, which is kind of this uh, yeah, garden city 
uh, reception in Vienna. So um, yeah, it would be interesting really to to trace the connections between the spa town and the garden city movement. Absolutely. Thank you. So let's move a little bit away from the spa town and reflect on another argument of your presentation and your book. And uh, this is also another in very interesting topic in, in, your, in your publication. And that is the modernity um, of those architectures of health, which um, persons like Gideon or Le Corbusier have referred to. Um, how, would you, how would you assess the connection of architectures of health, spa towns, and the avant-garde movement and the Bauhaus, so kinds of like that. It connects a bit to the question before, but how would you um, yeah, address this? Um, well, actually today, just as I was um, going through the PowerPoint slides um, just before the talk and having a look at it, and I was thinking about the idea of um, functional architecture and functionalism and how how the modernists have claimed it as being their their wonderful invention there's something um incredible that they came up with and then i was looking at the roman baths and thinking well no um it's been going on for a while um one of the things i've really noticed um with the research in my books not just on the the bathing architecture and public baths, but also quarantine architecture. These were architectures of function of process. Mm -hmm. So the way that people were directed through various doors in, in terms of the bath and the bathing, um, and they were directed down corridors to waiting rooms. There were a series of doors and gatekeepers, um, whether they be bath attendants or whether they be locked doors or um, no access this way, only access that way. Um, the way that the function was very strictly controlled by the architecture and through the architecture um, is something which I think coming through to that kind of modernist period is something which was used. And I think Gideon actually, I've got to go back and have another really decent read of Gideon because I think he's kind of actually starting to say a lot of that. But um, I think sometimes today um, we've kind of, we've forgotten to look at look at these things in that way. But I, I really think that functionalist way of looking at architecture is um, has got some keys to it somewhere in there. Yeah, I, I just found a couple, of, a couple of months ago, I found a quotation by Hugo Hering. You may have heard of him, a Berlin a city planner of the 20s. And he was reviewing a, um, a book by Le Corbusier and he writes in this review, oh yeah, uh, Le Corbusier, very interesting uh, plans. This reminds me on spa towns because you have um, a very green open floor plan and then you have single single buildings within a park and this reminds him on the spa town this is interesting to read this like kind of conversation between two modernists reflecting about spa towns um, and their um, urban situation and uh, finally one one last question um uh, I thought it really important in your book um, to read in the last chapter on the relevance of the ideas of the 19th century um, for our times of, yeah, you could say um, medical uh, crisis. Um, and because the, the aspect of relevance is, I, I think, an issue of, of spa towns, especially smaller spa towns today in, in Central Europe or in Europe. And I guess the colleagues of the HERA project might, might agree on that. Um, so especially smaller spa towns, um, I think they have to create a new relevance for today. So why they are, why do, why do they matter? And, and how could, could they add something new to the long history of bathing and curing and, and all the things uh, you were talking about? And my question before this background would be, um, where is the conversation between doctors and communities and architects now today from your point of view? Is it in the spa towns or is it in the architectural firms or where is it? Honestly, compared to what was happening in the the 19th and up to the mid 20th century, I think the conversation has has stopped. I I, I really have been struggling to see decent two way conversations between the medical profession and the architectural and engineering um, profession. I mean, in the 19th century and the early 20th century, you could find building plans for sanatoriums and quarantine stations being published in journals like in medical journals so the medical journals were carrying architectural plans and articles yes. about town planning mm -hmm. and 
the pro medical professionals were going and speaking at architectural and planning conferences. And it wasn't uncommon. Um, there were spots in the programs for medical doctors to be talking um, to, you know, town planners about what, what they saw as the best way kind of to design. Well, they, they were not telling them how to design, but they were providing them with the information mm -hmm. that enabled the designers to go out and design. And I think this is one of the issues we've had with this current um, COVID crisis is that the provision of information which is authentic and trustable and dependable to those people who um, um, are having to roll out programs and having to set up quarantine stations um, and those kind of things. They need the, the facts, basically, the real facts. And I think sometimes there's been a lack of communication or maybe too much communication or miscommunication mm -hmm. um, going on. And I think that can be a slight problem. I think it also needs to be in very plain, straightforward, understandable terms. Architects don't have the medical training and, well, medical doctors don't have the architectural training. So it's about meeting, making that common ground where they're actually speaking in plain terms, which both of them can understand. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's one of the things that really came out of my research was the fact that why are we not seeing building plans published in medical journals anymore? Um, mm -hmm. explaining to the doctors this is how buildings work and mm -hmm. you know if you've got a surface and you touch it you know um, mm -hmm. there are ramifications which all of a sudden we're very conscious of these mm -hmm. days um, so I'm hoping that um, there'll be a bit more conversation starting um, mm -hmm. to, to appear and I think that cross that interdisciplinary that cross disciplinary um, collaboration would be great if that kind of came out of the current situation yeah I mean, honestly, I was very excited to see that Beatrice Colomina had, had um, a, a special issue of EFLUX on um, Corona and architecture. But then again, it really stays within the realms of architectural professions. So architects are publishing about architecture. And um, yeah, let's see where this conversation uh, will, uh, will lead. Um, but thank Oliver, you so much. Yeah. Oliver, could you perhaps um, give this... Um, um, link to the to the journal to the special yes. issue into the chat so that we could find of it course. there yeah, yeah. I will, uh, yeah. So Alex I will do it now asking the same <laughs> already yeah. so thank you very much i mean thank these you. were they were great questions i mean sort of you really sort of uh, put the the already great talk into a, 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 a still bigger kind of context that was very very helpful thank you very much for this and I think it's now high time, obviously, to open the floor uh, to the others. Uh, I've seen that Henrike has already collected an, a number of questions. Um, and um, I would suggest that um, when uh, uh, Henrike calls you to, to ask a question, that you quickly uh, switch on your camera if, in case you haven't done so. Uh, Obviously, if there's a technical problem, then you can't, but uh, so that we have uh, at least a few faces uh, that we can speak to when uh, discussing issues among ourselves, right? Um, Henrike, will you sort of uh, go down yeah. your list then? Of course. Hello to everybody from my side as well. So as ex to be expected, questions are coming in. Uh, Julie, thank you for being with us today and taking your time for answering all these questions. The first two will be by uh, the colleague hiding behind the pseudonym TVD Dunk One. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then follows Alex Dreis Francis. So please, you two uh, um, go uh, one after the other. Sophie was say just signal that her question has already been uh, posed and, and answered. So she kindly draws back. There was a question earlier by Sophie to a detail in the slide. So I think maybe Julie and Sophie can sort that out uh, later. So starting with the first two questions and I'm collecting uh, the next bunch. Thomas. So TVD dunk one, please. Thomas, what, what's the matter? Oh. Hey, no, we can't hear you. No. <laughs> oh, 
Okay, perhaps then, Thomas, uh, we uh, pass the floor on to Alex. In the meantime, you try to sort out your microphone problems. Otherwise, in the worst case, you needed to ask your question uh, in a written form. Yeah. Okay, so Alex. Uh, hi there, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Hi, Alex Dreis Francis, University of Amsterdam. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, fascinating presentation and um, also wonderful visuals and um, broad range of interdisciplinary considerations. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is about Orientalism, um, which is a feature that I noticed quite sort of regularly viewing the images. You know, there seems to be a tendency either towards rectilinearity and modernity, um, but there's also uh, numerous buildings which encompass a kind of oriental fantasy. And there is a history of um, some of these uh, spa pioneers traveling in the Ottoman Empire and in the Balkans um, and bringing back models from there. So if you could comment on that, yeah. And the second question is a provocative one, um, which just occurred to me. Is there any research on the relationship between um, uh, uh, thermal and health and architecture and concentration camps? Um, because, of course, if you learn to clean people, you can also learn to um, do the opposite with them. Um, and uh, that's just a, a provocation um, question. Yeah. Uh, thank, thanks, Alex. Um, the first question, um, yeah, on orient Orientalism, um, I think I should also mention that Malcolm Schifrin has done, has a wonderful website called the Victorian Turkish Baths, and I think he's done a book of it as well, which- I think um, I, I, I corresponded with him once, yeah, I think I know. Yeah, um, so that's a fantastic website um, full of all sorts of things. Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting in terms of the way that architecture has been um, used, uh, trying to think of the right word to say it. I want to say, just say stolen. Um, the, the, the use of the dome, the use of the minarets, the use, the, the changing of a minaret into a, um, a smokestack or a chimney stack, I find um, could be uh, seen as quite um, an interesting uh, shift. But I think really when you start to look at it in terms of um, tourism, and starting to look at it in terms of theme park, maybe it's early theme park architecture, maybe the Victorian Turkish bark with, uh, bath was the beginnings of the theme park, big, the beginnings of Disneyland. Um, yeah, it's it's quite interesting, but it, it, it reflects what was happening at the time. Um, you look at the chinoiserie and the, in, the interiors, the, the porcelain, those kinds of things which were um, uh, having an impact um, it, in a way, it was telling people you, if you went there and you appreciated that, it showed that you had some kind of culture because you had the ability to travel um, in much the same way that today travel can be seen as a way of a status symbol. Um, so I guess if you have that appreciation of Orientalism and Orientalist architecture, at that time, it was showing that you were cultured and, and wealthy enough to have traveled and to have the means of traveling. Um, so that's probably one aspect of it. And I guess the other way is that if you didn't have the means of traveling, you could experience it by going to these Turkish baths that looked that had domes and, and glass stars in the ceiling. Um, and that was possibly another way of, of kind of looking at that. Um, Oh, your second question on quarantine stations and concentration camps. Um, this is uh, quite quite a provocation indeed. Um, it, it's true. I mean, the quarantine stations and the, uh, the bathing and the steaming of luggage, um, that was something which was really, that was what they were designed to do. They were designed to bring in um, people and, and clean them and inspect them. Um, in sometimes quite an, an inhumane way. Um, but at the same time, as we know today with COVID, it was the way that they were protecting themselves from diseases. Um, I mean, here I am in Australia, which is the largest island in the world. And um, we've had our borders shut both in and out for over 12 months now. Um, so, and when my partner came back from uh, Scotland, where he was working, um, he had to serve two weeks of quarantine in a hotel with no windows, um, locked in with police guards out the 
in the corridor. So um, yeah, quarantine is is quite an interesting situation. And yeah, I don't know whether I can really liken anything to concentrations camps or not, but it's certainly um, interesting. Okay, uh, next on the list is Tom Thanks. Thomas. Have, have you repaired your m microphone? No. Christian, just wait a second because there was a short follow up okay. to Orientalism so by Richard Kodiowski. So maybe we, we, we take that before Thomas follows and I'll just read it. Are there examples of orientalized bath architecture for working classes? I think the, um, so they were open to the public. Um, and quite often for a small fee. So they were still, they weren't um, free kind of, most of these public baths did attract a, a charge. So there was an entry fee kind of thing, but yes, there were um, facilities, Turkish bath type facilities um, for the public, the Melbourne city baths, which actually are still standing in Melbourne, um, incorporated a Turkish bath and they were open to the public. So. Um, they weren't aimed at the working classes, but they were open to anyone who could pay the fee. Thank you, Julie. So now, Thomas, if you're prepared with your microphone, you could go ahead. Nee, dat ziet er niet goed uit. Thomas, je moet het gewoon opschrijven in de chat. Yeah, just just type it into the chat, and then meanwhile, I would say that Christian Barnbeck continues with the next question. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. It's working? Okay. Uh, sorry, my English became a little bit rusty over Corona. It's long ago that I was talking in English, but I try to answer my question, uh, to uh, tell you my question. Um, I'm very interested in the development of European um, um, parks, of, of the spa parks, of our common picture of that. Um, so the first example I found for a real spa park where you have really the structure in the middle is a park and surrounding of the park are hotels and um, yeah places where people can sleep and inside the park you have the therapeutic buildings widespread. For me the first place I could found was Marianne Skelastner in uh, Czechos uh, I think it was founded in 1813. Um, the other second example is my own hometown, uh, Bad Oeynhausen, one of the Royal Prussian Basis places, where you could also find in the middle, the first thing they built was a park with uh, the, the, the widespread uh, therapeutic buildings inside. Do you know any other examples, maybe earlier in the 19th century in Europe, where you can find that structure? Or is it really like Marianne Selaske is the first one? And then the second one, Bad Oeynhausen, because the king who founded the bars here was one of the spa guests in Marianska Laske. <laughs> or is there, are there other examples for such a romantic English landscape park with the therapeutic buildings inside? I, I think that would be, they would be pretty early. Um, from what I'm, I'm kind of trying to remember that, but the 18... 13 that that's quite early I mean so I guess they were open so they weren't private as such they were they were open to the public so public visitors could come so I mean public parks yeah they that would be around the earlier sort of times of when they were starting to emanate and that's the area of the world where they were coming from as well I think quite often we think of public parks as um or quite often they're celebrated as being a British invention and actually they really weren't, they were coming from that kind of Prussian area um, from what I've, from the research that I've been able to um, discover with my limited language skills being limited generally to the English language things. But I think that kind of, I'd be really interested, I should really do a little bit of digging and I could maybe get in contact with you later on um, and, and follow up with that because that's a really good question. Um, and something that I think is probably worth looking into. That would really, really, really uh, interest me. So maybe I can give you my email address about the chat. Yeah, absolutely. That would be perfect. Or I, I, we can link can the can... two of you. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Collins.
That's okay. Christian, you, you mentioned before we come to the next question, type by, by Thomas, you mentioned your hometown. Maybe you say two words about your affiliation and your, your, uh, your, 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 what you're doing in Bad Oeynhausen. Uh, Just to shortly introduce uh, actually, yourself. Actually, I'm the city guide in Bad Oeynhausen, but I do a lot of research on spa architecture in Prussia. So also in my university, I, I was writing about the um, connection between the um, excavations in Pompeii during the 19th century and the influence on spa architecture in Prussia, because we have one of the first prototype bathing houses of Germany, which was copied in a lot of different German towns. And it's a lot influenced by the Villa of Diomedes in Pompeii, which is a very beautiful link, I guess, uh, where you can see like the modern architecture, architecture is developing also because they are rediscovering the uh, the ancient bathing architecture, which is for me a fascinating thing. And this is what I'm working with actually. Thank you, Christian. Just to mention from my side that you are part of a civic association working on spa development in cooperation with the, the spa agencies, so to say, and I suppose this might be interesting to, to others as well. So now we have the question by Thomas typed in as there is a problem with the microphone, so I will read it. <laughs> it is written in keywords, Julie. Have a remark related to a question. In your lecture, you mixed three categories, perhaps a bit too easy. One, medical healthiness of a special kind of water, the spa, a place you have to travel to. Second, the hygiene of average water, the public baths, possible everywhere. You go to your own town. Three, the sport aspect, swimming. Question. You shortly mentioned the Ottoman tradition, visible heritage in Budapest still. Is it of category one or two? Hope my point is clear. And this is a interesting and complex question. I, I use the opportunity to say there are still questions coming in. So to everybody asking and answering, uh, try to be brief because we, we start running, getting short of time. Um, thanks, Thomas. Um, I think I think it will be the category one, probably. Um, I think it's got, I think, I think really because it comes from that kind of Byzantine, it, I think it harks back to the Roman tradition, um, the, the Roman baths style, but instead of using mainly water, it was kind of using a mainly a steam or a vapor bath. The Victorian Turkish bath, which developed out of it, they, they meddled a little bit with the technology. They changed the technology to reflect um, the kinds of, um, I guess, the steam, steam, the invention of kind of steam engines and pumps and those sorts of things as well. So they, they modified it to reflect their modern kind of um, technology and then harked back um, to the design and the style of the, of the Ottoman type buildings. But I think it's a kind of a, it's more akin to to the Roman style baths. So, um, because I would say they were mainly associated before they had steam engines and things like that. They were mainly associated with springs and thermal, thermals, naturally occurring thermals. So it would have been somewhere which you kind of went to, to bathe um, and then, yeah, went away from. So I think it's that rather than the cleanliness um, Although now that I'm saying that, um, possibly the cleanliness did have a fair bit to do with it, but it wouldn't have been cleanliness the way we think of cleanliness as in our daily shower type cleanliness. So I hope that helps. I'm not sure if it does or not. And perhaps a, a quick footnote, if I may. I mean, let's not forget about the fact that in the spas themselves, there was a kind of up and down in the fashions of either bathing or taking the waters or both, mm -hmm. right? Sort of, um, so there is not an, a, a kind of naturally given continuity in that. So um, that makes the perhaps the, the answer to this question even more tricky. Tricky questions. So supposedly continuing with those. Uh, next three questions are by Astrid Köhler, Sophie Vassé and Oliver Sucro. Please have a look at the chat sometimes in between as well as they are coming in comments to the questions uh, discussed. So Astrid, please go ahead. 
Thank you, Henrike, and thank you very much, Julie, for your wonderful talk. I have lots of questions I'll be asking two now. Uh, number one, you sort of gave us a historical trajectory, if you like, from the thermal spa to the swimming pool, yeah? Um, now, in order to move from a relatively small thermal basin to a swimming pool, I need to learn to swim. And I want to know when historically swimming as a, yeah, I mean, widespread uh, skill um, was happening and how. That is my question number one. Question number two, coming back to the whole question of the hammam and the Turkish spa, uh, you mentioned Master Urquhart, who... Um, sort of brought this to Britain. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Was it really via this travel book that you showed us briefly or how did it become yeah, uh, um, sort of of significance? Because it is true that if we look across Europe today, it really is, it's, it's sort of Hungary coming obviously from the Ottoman yeah, influence and mm. it is Britain, which is an island. Yes, yeah, so it must, it can't come directly from the Ottoman influence. These are the two places in, in my recollection that have a relatively yes, strong presence of these Turkish baths. Thank you. Yeah, um, so with regard to swimming, I've got to tell you, I'm, I don't know when it became something which most people or people learned to do. Um, there were swimming baths in the, so I think the Olympics being in 1896 and having swimming as a sport is possibly one indicator I'm not sure when it became common in terms of the, how many of the population learned to swim, um, that kind of side of things. So I'm not, not really sure. I mean, here in Australia, it was kind of um, it's national sport, um, something which I was never terribly good at. Um, but yeah, so I can't really answer about when. It was still very became. rare. Yeah, in, uh, around 1800, you just had a few people. Yes, it was sort of uh, relatively. Mm. Um, yes. So with regards to the hammam, I mean, Urquhart, from what I can understand, um, brought it back to the UK um, via his kind of travels in Constantinople and his kind of um, publicising it in that way. From what I can understand of him, he then assisted people in terms of teaching them or showing them how to construct these baths. So he seemed to have been a little bit of an amateur architect um, as well. There was someone called Richard Barter, um, who was a baths, he, he had a hydropathic um, establishment and he had started some sweat, what he called sweat baths, which were based on the Irish model. Uh, he was, so this was up in Ireland and he actually invited Urquhart to come up and help him to establish a better version of these steam baths. Um, he then employed an architect with the same name, Richard Barter, and strangely though, he didn't send him to Turkey to have a look at them. He sent the, him along to, to Rome to look at the Roman baths mm -hmm. and then came back and, and um, constructed some in the UK. But yeah, I think that was very much a kind of a 19th century, uh, a travel. It was really so much to do with tourism and travel and bringing ideas back. Whereas Hungary, I would expect, I haven't done terribly much research into it. I would expect there would be a much more direct. Oh, yeah, it's absolutely direct in Hungary. That's, yeah. Just, yeah, that's yeah. an Ottoman yeah, uh, creation there. There's yes, no but I, I don't know terribly much about that. So you probably know a lot more than me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then, so now we have time for your question. Sophie Vassé, please. Thank you, delighted to be here. Uh, I'm Sophie Vassé, I work on 18th century spas. I had a question about hammams because I'm not, something is unclear to me in the 18th century, there are a lot of ways of using steamed mineral water, including in local applications, um, and you could really direct uh, steam from mineral waters, but uh, in the hammams that you have shown, is it mineral water or is it just common water? From what I can understand, it's common water and they used um, boilers, um, like, um, 
what we call like hot water systems like boilers where they would have a furnace um, and boil up the water to create it um, and then pipe it around. So, I mean, it really came with that age of steam when steam trains and steam engines and the, that kind of manufacturing um, industrialization uh, kind of helped them to make steam engines, which they then used in bathhouses effectively um, to pump steam around. So it's very mechanical, very industrial process. Um, and I know the bathhouses in general in the United Kingdom, um, they were actually contributing to the smoke and air pollution. Um, and there was some smoke abatement acts that had to be brought in and bathhouses and laundries were one of the main polluters apparently. So Very interesting, thank you. Indeed, very interesting. Thank you, Julie, for taking all the questions. So um, I think we had almost one and a half hour of uh, intensive uh, talks and uh, discussions. I think there would be, Christian, still time for one question. I don't have anyone on my list, but if there are still... Open we, we Oliver sort of... Suko. You had Oliver Suko yeah. on your list. Oh, he, he wrote in the chat that it was just a, okay. a, a, a comment or a follow-up, but of course we can... Yeah. use the time but for that as well perhaps we sort of uh, briefly refer to some of the comments also in the in the chat because i understand it's very difficult to discuss questions and at the same time keep them sort of uh, at bay um so there were some um comments on the question of the parks right and we've got one contribution from kissingen um and uh, the kissingers are i think very proud of their early core park um, probably, um, I, I understand that this, this discussion uh, probably needs a bit of a more precise framing and we could invite simply the participants to get in touch with each other about it, because I think sort of the, the suggestions that Christian made were very specific, right? It, it had to be an English landscape park, which sort of limits the, the date that you can go back to. Uh, whereas obviously many other continental spas had parks that were quite central for the development. I think of Pyrmont in Germany, I think of, of spa itself, um, where sort of the, the borders between park and sort of natural kind of embedding were also uh, not so extremely clear. So it, it seems to be an interesting question to follow up. Um, and I can invite, uh, invite simply uh, everyone who uh, is interested in that to give me a quick shout per email after we finish. And then I sort of uh, invite you and bring you together. Paul, Simon, uh, Paul Simons has also um, uh, added a few comments on the uh, backdrop of the common uh, UNESCO bid of 11 great spas in Europe, uh, in, in the context of which quite a bit of research has been done on uh, some aspects of these towns, um, and he uh, also sort of claims that um, some uh, um, parklands uh, of uh, aristocratic estates um, were developed earlier um, than uh, the uh, Marienbad example uh, would suggest. I understand by this, Paul, perhaps you want to uh, comment directly on that, that these were turned into sort of uh, spa or resort areas than later, right? Sort of these these country houses, is that right? Yeah, uh, yeah, hi, hi everybody. Yeah, um, I'm sorry I had to join a little late this morning and sorry, Julie, I, I, I didn't hear all your presentation. Uh, yeah, th th this is correct. And, and there's one World Heritage Site already, Bad Muskau on the German Polish yeah. where there is a in the estate grounds of the landscape gardens. <clears throat> And we have seen these going back, also aristocratic estates in France, Vitel uh, in particular, con then converted by, by the, the main country house to incorporate picturesque spa buildings within the parks. Um, and some of the, and uh, we have de also detected the influence of doctors on the way some of these aristocratic estates and also what we might now call municipal parklands, parklands controlled by the city authorities, back into the 17th century where they were escaping gardens uh, and the doctors were specifying the routes in the gardens, they were, dis they were specifying easy routes, medium routes and difficult routes for different types of exercise 
and they were telling you uh, what impact this different exercise would have on your health. Um, and in other parks where the uh, clients were too um, obese, shall we say, to even walk, you could be taken on carriage drives and the bumpier the carriage drive was, the more it shook your body up to move the toxins within your bodies. And they were talking about this in treati doctor's treatise in, in Bath, where I, I am in the UK, in the 16th century. So uh, I, I'm fascinated how, and nobody yet has really researched, in my, under, in my knowledge, how the doctors and the municipal authorities at the time and the private landowners got together to develop parks for a therapeutic purpose and also a commercial purpose to attract business. And I, I, I think that whole idea is fascinating and, and I've not come across any really in-depth research about that as yet. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Paul. Um, I just want to po um, point to another comment in, in the chat uh, by Anna Maria Boll, who points to a, a publication by Fred Kasper, who's a German architectural historian who has worked on parks and published broadly on that, not just um, in, uh, in this um, um, title that is uh, listed here from 2016, but I think he was involved also in some way or the other in the UNESCO bid, I, I understand. I, I think I remember he has written to, in some of the publications there as well. So that's very important. And the other thing, obviously, that comes to mind uh, on the basis of Paul's comment is the fact that particularly, again, in Germany, where many of these uh, spa towns emerged in the territory of small principalities, right? Indeed, the, um, the, the ruling dynasties were among the, the early spa entrepreneurs, if you want to, to, to call it like this. And uh, therefore, sort of residencies, residence towns turned into spa towns. And um, from their quality of being resident towns for these small dynasties, they had already things that, that belonged simply to, to, to a castle or a um, a, a, a place, a residency um, of, of a local prince, right? So uh, in that sense, obviously other spas, uh, like uh, particularly Bad Oeynhausen that Christian brought into the discussion is, is certainly different. Um, that's another kind of type that we see particularly in the area there, um, but, but, but elsewhere in Germany as well, and probably across Europe um, as well, is that sort of the industrial uh, use of brine, Right, um, sort of as as a kind of byproduce, or as a as a as a consequence of of uh, a lack of economic viability, gives birth to new spa places. And uh, interestingly enough, I mean this this has happened until I think the late twentieth century in Germany. Right, sort of that uh, the existence of some type of sources. Um, and uh, particularly active industrial drilling for <laughs> sources has produced then um, the, the, the use and the creation of new smaller spa towns, particularly in the south of Germany on the Austrian border. Okay, so um, do we have other issues in the chat, except uh, many thank yous and goodbyes from people that had to leave us now? Um, do we do we still have? Oh yeah, we have the remark by Marjorie Connolly, uh, one uh, of Henrique's students um, who grew up in New York uh, in the neighborhood of the Brooklyn Baths. Um, they were obviously replaced by a public uh, pool where she learned to swim. Uh, Marjorie, are you still around? Do you want to sort of uh, tell us the story in a bit more detail? Yeah, yeah. I I just did a little research on my own because I was so surprised to see. And I've just found this picture I'll drop in the chat from some some random mommy blog. Um, but the the it's kind of a locally famous pool because the the train runs past right outside. And so the people on the train can see into the pool and it looks all warm and steamy and nice. And the people I went to high school there, the, the teams practice and you can see out to the train. Um, so really amazing to find out about the building that was there before. Thank you, Marjorie. Okay. Uh, Henrike, you, I think, um, have a better view over what yeah, is happening think, in the chat. Yeah, I, I saw Paul typing, so maybe that's <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, it seems to be uh, poetry. Yeah, I, I see that there are two new. 
at least at least to my knowledge there are no direct questions and you have addressed mm -hmm. most of the comments it's, it's, a time, it's a question of, of time as well how much time and energy julie has still left to answer these incoming questions and questions or whether we want to go uh, to continue with a with a discussion among our participants or we slowly come to an end so but at, at least from my point of I view i would sort of be very sad if we came to an end right now <laughs> because my long list of questions obviously i can also try so to, from my to... side the floor is open to you if julie is still <laughs> be able to share her Thank time you. Yeah, sort of. I mean, there were. I mean, there, um, I've I've already. Uh, yeah, thought sort of Alex was going a bit f too far with his sort of concentration camp question, but I mean, sort of one of the. I mean, there's these kind of visual associations that you get, and when you was you were showing this end of the 19th century. Uh, popular bath, a uh, douche bath type of things in these shed-like uh, constructions, right? One of the things that I started thinking of, uh, which is obviously also an underexplored link, there is um, not just the question of, of, of swimming. When when did that become popular? My, my sort of gut feeling, although I can't prove it, would be the uh, compulsory military service uh, might have played a role there. Um, but I'm not so sure about it, but, but that would obviously date it somewhere in the second half 19th century. But then I, with these douche sheds, I mean, sort of, I'm, I'm based in the Netherlands, right? And the popular way of spending your holidays is camping. Sort of, it terribly reminds one of these kind of, you know, uh, installations you find on the camping ground. So obviously here's another underexplored kind of link between different kind of holiday styles but but i mean it's it's, it's the, this kind of rationality of using these kind of water resources to to provide a, a type of hygiene where it's not naturally given right uh, this obviously is very much the same concept that, but that's just an aside my my main question actually um goes in a totally different direction when you were talking about the conversation between architectural specialists and doctors and about the functionality of spa architecture, right? So if, um, you seem to go a bit beyond the obvious kind of facade functionality. Many of the 19th century buildings, they are eclectic in their sort of exteriors, right? And the, the mixture of styles, but you seem to argue that internally they follow a clear kind of functional setup. And this is where my, my question comes in. You, you used, uh, among others, the term gatekeepers, sort of the personnel that sort of organizes kind of the, the proceeding of, of the visitors through these baths. And, and, and here my question comes in. One of the fundamental problems that we will have to discuss in some way or uh, the other in our project is this relationship between publicity or openness, inclusion and exclusion. And I wonder um, whether you would argue that this functionality uh, was also pertaining to this. Obviously these plunge baths, right? They were a sort of public places, I understand, where, where more than one visitor would be. So they would be somehow opposed to the use of these uh, top, uh, departments, if I may say so. Can you comment a bit on this question of architecture and social opening uh, and perhaps social exclusion? Yeah, I found it quite interesting looking at the design of um, the individual bath cubicles um, and the height of the walls as well was something interesting because quite often they just had partitions which would go up to here yeah. or here depending on um, the building. But so there would still be, you'd still be able to hear what was going on across the whole building, but you wouldn't be able to see. So there's that kind of visual privacy as well. So that issue, that yeah, issue of privacy, um, personal privacy um, is something which is really interesting. Um, and I guess the idea of swimming and whether people were wearing swimming costumes um, is another um, aspect of it and when bathing became something which you did with nothing on or you had a swimming costume. It kind of, if you look back to the bathing machines um, in the, for yeah. sea bathing, where the person would be in the back of this pretty much like a horse-drawn carriage and they'd be backed into the sea 
and then under a, a it looked like a concertina type fabric hood they would slip out from there and bathe um, from what I can understand men were not wearing bathing costumes but from, um, from what I can understand women were wearing a lot of pretty much dresses um, effectively um, so there were a few diff differences going on there um, what happened when it happened internal when they came internally into the bathhouse or the spas I, I don't I mean swimming costumes were not something which occurred until the swimming for sport or swimming for recreation started to occur. And I think that would be about that kind of turn of the century period. But I think the, 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 the individual bathing cubicle is quite interesting, especially when there were doors um, starting to appear on those and that was very much an individual process. Um, the other aspect is um, children and what was happening with children, whether they were allowed to accompany their parents, whether they were bathing at all, whether they were just going for a swim in the lake, um, those kinds of things. I mean, these are these are the sorts of um, issues which I think you can actually start to read from the architectural plans. And one of my favourite things to do is to trace the passageway of a, a user through the bathhouse or through any building really. Um, so the visual records that architecture leaves behind, they're social and cultural documents, as well as being technical documents about how the buildings were constructed. Through most um, building plans, you can actually find the front door, um, look at where the windows are, look at where the door swings were, whether there was anybody, any offices um, in between or not, and start to you know imagine yourself into that building and tracing the path. Um, and that's something which you can do from looking at the elevations as well as the plans. I um, mean, also looking at how many people these buildings were designed to um, have in there at any one time and the spatial um, dimensions and how many cubicles there were. Um, so yeah, I, th I think there's a lot of questions in there. And I think that issue of privacy and, and publicity is, is something um, which uh, probably needs a lot more research actually. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. So there would be one last question by Astrid, if we still have the time. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, I'll ask one more of my, uh, my questions. Um, you spoke about the seaside resorts and that they both obviously advertise the water. It's, it's a def different qualities, but also the air. Now, uh, Henry did use that the seaside resorts are in a way the forerunners of cl climatic resorts. And if there, is there any uh, literature about that? Uh, yes, so in terms of um, fresh air, um, that's something I've dealt with a lot um, when I've been doing my, my wider research. Um, and in my book, I talk a lot about um, tuberculosis. So tuberculosis was one of the, the key diseases um, of the time and fresh air um, became known as one of the, the they thought was a cure for it. Um, and at that time they were saying either altitude was kind of um, one way of, of getting well again. Um, and they believed that altitude because of the, the thinness of the air was, uh, was good for the lungs of the tubercular because it was easier to breathe and things like that. Um, but at the same time, they were also saying um, trips to the, to the coast um, were another um, way to improve. But at the same time, um, there was a, I think it was George Boddington who was, um, who was a tuberculosis specialist um, said, you know, he, he was pretty um, skeptical of this climatic um, uh, answer um, on saying that doctors were just sending people away um, and there where they were in those kind of um, retreats being under exactly the same regimen that they were in the cities, they would commonly die. So um, it was kind of like some some medical professionals thought that doctors were just trying to get rid of their patients who were likely to die by sending them elsewhere, which is kind of a bit concerning. But yeah, the the fresh the fresh sea air and the um, mountain air were both known to be, or both thought to be curative. Um, as well, pine trees um, were thought to exude um, vapors, which were meant to be antiseptic and, and cleansing and disinfecting um, the pine forests in Prussia and those areas were renowned. And it's interesting um, uh, in Australia, along the coast, 
east, we have ribbons of pine trees which have been planted um, along the coast, um, which is quite interesting. And that's where the resorts were. And that's also where um, sanatoria as well as um, establishments for hydropathic establishments were as well. So I don't know whether the pine tree, what the aspect was of planting the pine trees around there, but um, quite often you'll find pine trees planted around these kind of resorts um, to clean the air, which is quite an, another interesting aspect. Mm. Thank you. Yes, that's, I think, sort of uh, the problem that we are sort of daily sort of uh, uh, quarreling with that uh, our spa topic goes all over the place in so many different directions, uh, nature, culture. Um, remains to thank you, Julie, for this really fantastic uh, talk, for this richly illustrated um, walk through 2000 history of bathing history, um, for your willingness to answer our question. Many thanks also to Oliver, who, as I said earlier, framed uh, this in, in, in very interesting directions. Thanks to everyone who's been joining us for this first talk. Looks like um, we uh, all learned a lot. Um, and um, I would like to point you to um, the following talks that we have, um, uh, again, uh, hopefully covering some aspects of spa history that are not so commonly uh, discussed, um, like for example, the um, spas in the colonies, uh, which Professor uh, uh, Eric Jennings will talk about in our next talk. I will take the liberty to send an invitation specifically for this talk to everyone who uh, um, asked to be included into today's talk. So uh, if, uh, if I don't hear otherwise from you, I will use that as the basis of a mailing list.